the Committee on Homeland Security's Subcommittee on Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Protection will come to order. Uh, first of all, I'm sure I speak for all of us here on the dais in expressing our deepest condolences to all of the family members and all of the uh, victims of yesterday's tra tragedy in Las Vegas. Um, events like the one yesterday really demand the utmost humanity um, in response to the, such blind hate and evil and hopefully it will give us all a renewed sense of purpose today as we approach the tasks of the day. The subcommittee is meeting today to receive testimony regarding the Department of Homeland Security's cybersecurity mission. I recognize myself for an opening statement. We are here today at the start of National Cybersecurity <coughs> Awareness Month to discuss what I believe is one of the defining public policy challenges of this generation, the cybersecurity posture of the United States. We've seen cyber attacks hit practically every sector of our economy with devastating impacts to both government agencies and the private sector alike. And it is our shared duty to ensure that we're doing our very best to defend against the very real threat our cyber adversaries are posing. But make no mistake, the cybersecurity challenges we face are about much, much more than simply protecting bottom lines or intellectual property or even our nation's most classified information. They also impact the personal and often irreplaceable information of every American. This year, we have seen on a grand scale just how much damage can be done by a single individual or entity looking to conduct a cyber attack. The Equifax breach shows that it takes only one bad actor and only uh, one exploitable vulnerability to do something to compromise the information of 145 million Americans. This is not the first cyber attack that has garnered national attentions, and unfortunately, it almost assuredly will not be the last. As the members of this panel and as our witnesses here today know well, there is no silver bullet or guaranteed technology to fix the cybersecurity problem. Rather, we need to be part of an ongoing, sustained, dedicated, persistent, and comprehensive campaign to ensure the United States remains the world's cybersecurity superpower. We will continue to need a sharp workforce and collective efforts in public-private partnerships and the leadership of our government agencies to leverage our resources and to counter our highly sophisticated cyber adversaries. Today, the subcommittee meets to hear from the government officials that are charged with meeting these cyber threats. These are the folks on the front lines day in and day out. DHS is the federal government's lead civilian agency for cybersecurity, and within it, the National Protection and Programs Directorate, or NPPD, leads our national effort to safeguard and enhance the resilience of our nation's physical and cyber infrastructure, helping federal agencies and, when requested, the private sector harden their networks and respond to cybersecurity incidents. NPPD partners with critical infrastructure owners and operators and other Homeland Security enterprise stakeholders to offer a wide variety of cybersecurity capabilities, such as system assessments, incident response, and mitigation support, and the ability to hunt for malicious cyber activity. This collaborative approach to mitigating cyber incidents is meant to prioritize meeting the needs of DHS's partners and is consistent with the growing recognition among government, academic, and corporate leaders that cybersecurity is increasingly interdependent across sectors and must be a core aspect of all risk management strategies. This committee has been working hard to ensure that NPPD and DHS in its entirety has the necessary authorizations and organization it needs to combat growing cyber threats. DHS needs a strong and sharp workforce and an efficient organizational structure to support both its cybersecurity and its infrastructure protection missions. Earlier this year, 
the committee marked up and passed H.R. 3359, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Act of 2017, to reorganize and to strengthen NPPD. As the cyber threat landscape continues to evolve, so should DHS. And in doing that, H.R. 3359 is the tool that we'll use to bring NPB, NPPD to a more visible role in cybersecurity of this nation. As a committee and as a Congress, we have taken important steps in the right direction with legislation on information sharing, on modernizing the federal government's information technology, and in getting our state and local officials the cybersecurity support that they need. Some of these programs have been years in the making. Real-time collaboration between the government and the private sector is a lofty and worthwhile goal. Through the Automated Indicator Sharing Program, or AIS, DHS has been partnering with industry to create and enhance that broader information sharing environment, and we've made progress in the right direction. While we know that proactive information sharing is only as good as the information being provided, that type of relationship can only be made possible with a strong foundation of trust. I'm looking forward to a robust discussion today, not only about how the department can be best organized and equipped to ensure that we are leveraging the resources of the federal government towards this immense challenge, but also how the government can forge and grow the necessary partnerships to achieve the greater cybersecurity for our nation. We have to get this right because new technologies, the Internet of Things, driverless cars, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing, they are all rapidly evolving. So we need to be securing at the speed of innovation and not at the speed of bureaucracy. We are in an era that requires flexibility, resiliency, and discipline. And I hope that I will hear those values operationalized in the forthcoming testimony. Cyberspace plays an increasingly dominant role in the fabric of the American society, and it will take continued collaboration across the public, private, international, and domestic spaces to keep making the advancements needed to prioritize cybersecurity for our country. I know this is a responsibility that everyone on this subcommittee takes extraordinarily seriously, and I look forward to the discussion today with our witnesses. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. I'm pleased that we're kicking off Cybersecurity Awareness Month by talking to the Department of Homeland Security about its cybersecurity mission and how Congress can help ensure DHS is well positioned to protect critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. Before I begin, however, I would like to send my condolences to the families of the victims of Sunday night's horrific shooting. To the survivors, you are in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, to the brave first responders who ran into danger when everyone else was running away from it, we are grateful. The Democrats on this committee have said this before, but it bears repeating. At some point, we're gonna have to come together and enact sensible uh, gun legislation. And as the congressman representing New Orleans, I cannot sit silently as the president insults the hurricane survivors of Puerto Rico and the San Juan mayor who's trying to help them. I've been through Katrina, and I know what it's like when you're at your most vulnerable moment and you've lost everything. And what you're looking for is assistance because it's beyond your capacity to respond to a storm of that magnitude. So I haven't seen the people grieve the loss of their homes and businesses and struggle to piece their lives back together. I can tell you that the last thing uh, the people in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands need are insults. I urge the president to take a break from Twitter, roll up his sleeves, and get to work. Turning to the issue at hand, as I mentioned, I represent New Orleans, which has significant energy sector assets. Last month, we heard disturbing reports of a new wave of efforts to breach energy sector networks in the United States. According to Symantec, in some cases, hackers achieved unprecedented access to operational systems. In light of these reports, I'm interested to know how the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Energy are working together to secure energy sector networks and make them more resilient. Additionally, 
As a member of this committee and the Congressional Task Force on Election Security, I am eager to hear about DHS's activities to secure our election systems. Although the administration's commitment to the critical infrastructure designation appeared to waver earlier this year, I was encouraged when Acting Secretary Duke told committee Democrats last month that there are no plans to rescind the designation. With that comment, I look forward to hearing about the progress DHS is making to help state and local governments secure election infrastructure and whether the department has adequate resources to carry out its responsibilities in that space. For example, I understand there's a nine month wait for a risk and vulnerability assessment and that some secretaries of state have complained about the lengthy clearance process for election officials. I'm concerned that these kinds of challenges may deter some states, particularly those hostile to the critical infrastructure designation, from taking full advantage of the resources DHS can bring to bear. To that point, DHS has struggled to build some of the relationships necessary to executing its election security mission. Although I've heard that DHS is making pro progress in this regard, I am concerned mistakes made notifying certain secretaries of state that their election infrastructure had been targeted, though it, though it had not been, may have undermined the trust that DHS has sought to build. I will be interested in learning what do you need from Congress to address election infrastructure requests more quickly and build trust within the election infrastructure community. Finally, when Ms. Manfred testified before the subcommittee in March, I asked when I could expect the DHS cybersecurity strategy. The strategy required pursuant to legislation I authored was due March 23rd. It still has not been submitted to Congress. I understand the Trump administration did not fill leadership positions relevant to the execution of DHS cybersecurity strategy with any real sense of urgency and ongoing vacancies may be contributing to the delays. But the strategy is six months overdue and that is not acceptable. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair uh, now welcomes and recognizes the chairman of the full committee, my colleague from Texas, Mr. McCall, for any opening statement that he might have. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ratcliffe. I also would like to extend uh, my thoughts and prayers to the victims and family members of the horrifying tragedy in Las Vegas. I'm hopeful that as Americans, we can come together and prevent such, such violence from happening uh, in the future. I'm pleased to be here at this uh, important um, hearing today with uh, uh, our distinguished uh, guest uh, here at this hearing. Uh, America's national security is uh, continued to, it's uh, threatened by Islamist uh, terrorist tyrannical regimes, building and proliferating weapons of mass destruction, human traffickers, transnational gang members like MS-13 who stream across our border. These threats are well known, and we need to do everything we can to stop them as we see them coming. However, we also find ourselves in the crosshairs of invisible attacks and sustained cyber war from nation states and other hackers. And as we become more and more uh, reliant on computers and smartphones in both our personal and professional lives, everyone is a potential target, and sadly, many of us have already been victims. Over the past few years, uh, we see many successful large-scale cyber attacks take place. In early September, hackers were able to breach uh, Equifax, a credit reporting agency gaining access to sensitive information on as many as 143 million people. In 2016, we know that Russia tried to undermine our electoral system and democratic process. And in 2015, we learned that China stole over 20 million security clearances, including mine, uh, and probably some here at, uh, at this dais. Uh, these kinds of violations are simply unacceptable. I'm proud to say that over the last few years, this committee the Committee on Homeland Security has recognized these threats and has led the charge in the Congress to strengthen the defense of our nation's networks. In 2014, we enacted several important bills that empowered DHS to bolster its workforce, codified DHS's cyber center, and updated FISMA for the first time in 12 years. A year later, the Cybersecurity Act became law, which enhances information sharing and makes DHS the lead 
conduit for cyber threat indicators and defensive measures within the federal government. While information sharing has come a long way, the WannaCry ransomware attack recently il illustrated just how important and beneficial these relationships are. Just last week, Rob Joyce, the cybersecurity coordinator at the White House, noted that we need to find a way to provide the private sector with more expansive access to cyber threat information in a controlled setting, something I believe we need to strengthen. Moreover, issues relating to the sharing of classified information with the private sector, uh, like accrediting SCIF space, granting security clearances to key personnel, and enabling consistent two-way communications are issues we are looking at closely. In other words, we've made great progress in the way indicators are shared, but I want to examine if we can do more regarding the overall sharing of classified information. Earlier this year, I was pleased to see President Trump issue an executive order to strengthen the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. Going forward, I'm hopeful that the House can advance legislation that I've introduced to elevate MPPD as a standalone agency and better support the cybersecurity mission at DHS. This month is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, a time to learn more about those, uh, these threats and offer ideas on how we can best secure ourselves against these growing threats. While we've had some success on this issue, we must do more. Our cyber enemies, including terrorists, are always evolving, <coughs> looking for new ways to carry out their next attack. And fortunately, this is an issue that I believe transcends party lines. It's not a Republican or Democrat issue. So let's work together uh, to make our cybersecurity strong and keep the American people uh, safe. Again, I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here today, and thank you for your service. And a very important uh, component of the department that often as I mentioned in my opening, we focus a lot on counterterrorism and the border and other things, but I consider this mission that the department has to be one of the most important uh, that this nation uh, uh, faces. Uh, so I look forward uh, to the um, conversation about how Congress and the executive branch can work together and how uh, we can work with leaders in the private sector to enhance the nation's uh, cybersecurity. So with that, I'd like to yield back to the chairman, and if I may, uh, submit my questions uh, for the record. Thank the chairman, and uh, the uh, chair now welcomes and recognizes the ranking minority member of the full committee, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, for his opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank Chairman uh, Ratcliffe and ranking member Richmond for holding today's hearing to examine the work DHS is doing to shore up our nation's cyber defenses. There's no doubt that our country is facing an ever uh, an evolving array of cyber threats. As we stand here today, our enemies are thinking of new and novel ways to strike at everything from banks to hospitals and chemical facilities. Nefarious actors even want to disrupt some of our most basic institutions. Last year, we learned that our nation's election system served as a new frontier for cyber attacks. With every passing day, we learn, learn of new ways cyber operatives are looking to exploit everything from the media we consume to the databases that store voter registration data. In this country, there's nothing more sacred than the ability to engage in civic activity, and cyber criminals are seeking to undermine our democracy. Furthermore, as I watched the devastation unfold in Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, I'm reminded of the fragility of our systems. Disrupting the systems we rely on for power, fuel, food, and water can be deadly, regardless of whether it's caused by a cyber attack or a natural disaster. In short, the digital network we rely on for our day-to-day -day life are facing a multitude of threats. To respond to these threats, Congress has put its trust in DHS. Over the past few years, Congress, by way of this committee, has consistently expanded DHS's cybersecurity mission, giving the department a key role in securing federal networks as well as the systems that support 
our nation's critical infrastructure. The department made huge strides in implementing these new authorities, including by standing up an automated system to share cyber threat data and advising the new election infrastructure subsector on how to promote cyber hygiene with election administrators throughout the country. We cannot, however, expect DHS to carry out these responsibilities with both hands tied behind its back. To be successful, the department needs adequate resources, a robust staff, strong leadership, and a clear strategy. Unfortunately, this administration has been gravely unfocused when it comes to cybersecurity. President Trump falsely promised to deliver a comprehensive plan to protect America's vital infrastructure from cyber attacks on the first day in office. It took months for the president to get around to issuing an executive order on cybersecurity. Also, a quarter of the 28-person National Infrastructure Advisory Council resigned in protest of President Trump's insufficient attention to cyber threats. President Trump floated the idea of an impenetrable cyber unit with Russia at the same time members of his administration were considering and ultimately deciding to ban the use of the Kapersky products on federal networks. Within DHS, the chief information officer resigned after serving only four months and the National Programs and Protection Directorate, the department's main cyber arm, is still operating without a permanent undersecretary. Whether the men and women in this room are willing to acknowledge in an open setting that they are struggling without this leadership, we can be certain these gaps are making their job harder. I look forward to hearing from the panel today about how the department is carrying out its cyber mission, and I hope that you'll be candid with us about the obstacles you face. If, the, if there are areas where you need additional resources or legislative clarity, tell us how we can help. I'm especially eager to hear from Ms. Hoffman about how DHS works with one of its key partners in securing critical infrastructure, the Department of Energy. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very important topic. Mr. Christopher Krebs is the senior official performing the duties of the Undersecretary of the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the United States Department of Homeland Security. Great to see you today, Mr. Krebs, and great to see you uh, in your new roles at DHS. Uh, Ms. Jeanette Manfra is the Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Communications in the National Protection and Programs Directorate at DHS. Also great to have you back before our subcommittee, Ms. Manfra. And finally, Ms. Patricia Hoffman is the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability at the U.S. Department of Energy. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I'd now like to ask the witnesses uh, to stand, raise your right hand so that I can swear you in to testify. Do each of you swear or affirm the testimony which you will give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, the witnesses' full written statements will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes Mr. Krebs for five minutes for his opening statement. Chairman Radcliffe, Ranking Member Richmond, Ranking Member uh, Thompson, members of the committee, good morning and thank you for today's hearing. In this month of October, we recognize National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, the time to focus on how cybersecurity is a shared responsibility that affects all Americans. The Department of Homeland Security serves a critical role in safeguarding and securing cyberspace, a core Homeland Security mission. I want to begin my testimony by thanking the committee for taking action earlier this summer on the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency Act of 2017. If enacted, this legislation would mature and streamline the National Protection and Programs Directorate, or NPPD, and rename our organization to clearly reflect our essential mission. 
The, depart the department strongly supports this much needed effort and encourages swift action by the full House and Senate. NPBD's mission statement is clear. We lead the nation's efforts to ensure the security and resilience of our cyber and physical infrastructure. We collaborate with other federal agencies, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, and of course, the private sector. Our three goals are as follows. Secure and defend federal networks and facilities. Identify and mitigate critical infrastructure systemic risk. Incentivize and broadly enable enhanced cyber and physical security practices. No question this is an expansive mission. As we meet today, I am proud to share with you the tireless efforts of so many at NPPD, and in coordination with our interagency partners to accomplish this mission. The targeting of our elections, wanna cry, not Petcha, intrusions into energy and nuclear sector infrastructure, Harvey, Irma, Maria, soft target attacks in London, Barcelona, Orlando, and most recently Las Vegas. As threats to our critical infrastructure evolve and in many ways remain the same, our people are partnering with owners and operators across America. We are engaging the public to raise awareness because our security is truly a shared responsibility. Today's hearing is about DHS's cybersecurity mission. Earlier this year, the President signed an executive order on strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. This executive order set in motion a series of assessments and deliverables to improve our defenses and lower our risk to cyber threats. DHS is organized around these deliverables by working with federal and private sector partners. We are emphasizing the security of federal networks. Across the federal government, agencies have been implementing the industry standard NIST cybersecurity framework. Agencies are reporting to DHS and the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, on their cybersecurity risk management uh, and mitigation acceptance choices. DHS and OMB are evaluating the totality of these agency reports in order to comprehensively assess the adequacy of the federal government's overall cybersecurity risk management posture. In addition to our efforts to protect federal government networks, we are focused on how government and industry work together to protect the nation's critical infrastructure. We are prioritizing deeper, more collaborative public-private relationships and partnerships. In collaboration with civilian, military, and intelligence agencies, we're developing an inventory of authorities and capabilities. We are prioritizing entities at greatest risk of attacks that could result in catastrophic consequences. We commonly call this our Section 9 efforts. Before closing, let me also discuss our continued efforts to address cybersecurity risk facing our election infrastructure. Facing the threat of cyber-enabled operations by a foreign government during the 2016 elections, DHS and our interagency partners conducted unprecedented outreach and provided cybersecurity assistance to state and local uh, election officials. Information shared included indicators of compromise, technical data, and best practices. Through num numerous efforts before and after election day, we declassified and shared information related to Russian malicious cyber activity. These steps have been critical to protecting our elections, enhancing awareness among election officials, and educating the American public. The designation of critical infrastructure, uh, of election infrastructure as critical infrastructure, provides a foundation to institutionalize prioritized services and support. We are working with federal, state, and local partners to develop information, sharing protocols, uh, and establish key working groups. Yet there is more to be done, and we shall not waver. In the face of increasingly sophisticated threats, NPPD is focused on defending our nation's critical infrastructure. The risks are complex and dynamic with interdependencies. Technological advances such as the Internet of Things and cloud computing increase access and streamlined efficiencies. However, they also increase access points that could be leveraged by adversaries to gain unauthorized access to networks. As new threats emerge and our use of technology evolves, we must integrate cyber and physical risk to in, in order to effectively secure our nation. Expertise around cyber physical risk and cross-sector critical infrastructure interdependencies is where NPPD brings <laughs> unique expertise and capabilities. Thank you for inviting me here to, today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Krebs. Ms. Manfrey, you are now uh, recognized for five minutes. Chairman Ratcliffe, Ranking Member Richmond, Ranking Member Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for holding today's hearing. 
I also want to begin my testimony by thanking this committee for taking action earlier this summer on the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Act of 2017. A name for our organization that reflects our mission is essential to our workforce, recruitment efforts, and effective stakeholder engagement. We must also ensure that NPPD is appropriately organized to address cybersecurity threats both now and in the future, and we appreciate this committee's leadership. Cyber threats remain one of the most significant strategic risks for the United States. Cyber risks threaten our national security, economic prosperity, and public health and safety. Our adversaries cross borders at the speed of light. Over the past year, Americans saw advanced persistent threat actors, including hackers, criminals, and nation states, increase in frequency, complexity, and sophistication. In my role at DHS, I head the Department's Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, which includes our 24-7 Watch Center and Operations, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. Our role goes along three work streams, instrumenting agency networks through the deployment of sensors, assessing and measuring agency vulnerabilities and risks, as well as critical infrastructure, and directing and advising actions that federal agencies and critical infrastructure entities can take to better secure their networks. As you well know, the NCIC is the civilian government's hub for cybersecurity information sharing, asset incident response, and coordination for both critical infrastructure and the federal government. As my colleague noted, we are emphasizing the security of federal networks. NPPD's assistance to federal agencies includes first, providing tools to safeguard civilian executive branch networks through our national cyber protection system and the continuous diagnostics and mitigation programs. Second, measuring and motivating agencies. And third, serving as a hub for information sharing and incident reporting. And finally, providing operational and technical assistance. Einstein, the sensors deployed as a part of the National Cyber Protection System, refers to the federal government's suite of intrusion detection and prevention capabilities that protects agencies' unclassified networks at the perimeter of each agency. Today, Einstein is a signature-based intrusion detection and prevention capability that takes action on known malicious activity. Our non-signature-based pilot efforts to move beyond signatures are yielding positive results. These capabilities are essential to discovery of previously unidentified malicious activity. We are demonstrating the ability to capture data that can rapidly be analyzed for anomalous activity using technologies from commercial, government, and open sources. The pilot efforts are also defining the future operational needs for tactics, techniques, and procedures, as well as the skill sets and personnel required to operationalize the non-signature-based approach to cybersecurity. Einstein is our tool to address perimeter security, but it will not detect or block every threat. Therefore, we must com complement it with systems and tools working inside agency networks. Our continuous diagnostics and mitigation pro program provides those tools and integration services to federal agencies. These tools are enabling agencies to manage risks across their entire enterprise. At the same time, these tools are also going to provide DHS visibility into our enterprise risk across the federal government through a common federal dashboard. <laughs> NPPD is also working with our interagency partners to prioritize high-value assets, or those systems for which a cyber incident could cause a significant impact to the United States. As part of this effort, we conduct security architecture reviews to help agencies assess their network architecture and configurations. We conduct in-depth vulnerability assessments of these prioritized assets to determine how an adversary would penetrate a system, move around an agency's network to access sensitive data, and exfiltrate such data without being detected. These assessments provide system owners with recommendations to address identified vulnerabilities, protecting them before an incident occurs. When necessary, the department also is taking targeted action to address specific cybersecurity risks through the issuance of binding operational directives. We are working to enhance cyber threat information sharing across the globe to stop cyber incidents before they start. These actions help businesses and government agencies protect their systems and quickly recover should such an act attack occur. By bringing together all levels of government, the private sector, international partners, and the public, we are taking action to protect against cybersecurity risks, improve, improve our whole of government incident response capabilities, enhance information sharing on best practices and cyber threats, and to strengthen resilience. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks, Ms. Manfra. Ms. Hoffman, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Chairman Ratcliffe, Ranking Member Richmond, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the continuing threats facing our nation's energy infrastructure and the Department of Energy's role. Cybersecurity and resilience of the energy sector is one of the Secretary's top priorities and a major focus of the Department. The Department of Energy is the sector-specific agency for cybersecurity of the energy sector. DOE works with DHS and jointly with other agencies, the private sector organizations, for a whole of government response to cyber incidents by protecting assets and countering threats. In addition, the Department of Energy serves as the lead agency for emergency support function 12, which is energy under the national response framework. As a lead, ESF 12 is responsible for facilitating restoration of damaged en energy infrastructure. The department works with industry, federal, state, and local partners to facilitate response and recoveries. Combining DOE's role as the SSA for cybersecurity with national response activity ensures that incidents, both cyber and physical impacts, are coordinated in the energy sector. At this moment in time, I would like to acknowledge that the Secretary does express his support for the victims of Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And I would also like to express my gratitude for all the utility workers that have wor been working very hard in the regions for restoring power. In extreme cases, the department can also use its legal authorities as those in the Federal Power Act as amended by the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act to assist in response and recovery operations. Congress enacted several important new energy security measures in this act as it relates to cybersecurity. The Secretary of Energy was provided emergency, was provided a new authority upon the declaration of a grid security emergency by the President to issue emergency orders to protect or restore critical electric infrastructure or defense critical electric infrastructure. This authority allows DOE to respond as needed to the threat of cyber and physical attacks to the grid. DOE has collaborated with the energy sector for nearly two decades in voluntary public-private partnerships that engage owners and operators at all levels, technical, operational, and executive, along with state and local governments to identify and mitigate physical and cyber risks to the energy systems. In the energy sector, the core partnerships have consisted with the Electric Sector Coordinating Council and the Oil and Gas Coordinating Council. In these meetings, interagency partners, including DHS, states, international partners come together to discuss important security and resilience issues for the energy sector. The electric sector specifically has been very forward-leaning and aggressive in trying to address cybersecurity issues. DOE plays a critical role in supporting the energy sector cybersecurity by building in security. Specifically, we have been looking at building capabilities in the sectors in three areas. The first area is preparedness, enhancing the visibility and situational awareness in operational networks as well as IT networks, increasing the align alignment of cybersecurity preparedness across multiple states and federal jurisdictions response and recovery activities and supporting the whole government effort, and leveraging the expertise of the Department of Energy's national labs to drive cybersecurity innovation. Threats continue to evolve. DOE is working diligently to stay ahead of the curve. The solution is an ecosystem of resilience that works in partnership with state, local, and industry stakeholders to advance best practices, strategies, and tools. To accomplish this, we must accelerate information sharing to better inform local investment decisions, encourage innovation, and the use of best practices to help raise the energy sector security maturity and strengthen local incident response and recovery activities, especially through the participation in training programs and exercises. I appreciate the opportunity to be here before the subcommittee and represent one of the sector-specific agencies and the energy sector cybersecurity capabilities. However, I would be remiss not to take a moment and stress the interdependent nature of our infrastructure and requires all sectors to be constantly focused on improving their cybersecurity posture. 
So DOE looks forward to continue to working with the federal agencies to share best practices and build a defense in depth. So with that, I would like to thank you for being here today and look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Ms. Hoffman. I now recognize, recognize myself for um, uh, five minutes of questions. Uh, Ms. Manfred, I want to start with you. You um, mentioned Einstein and CDM and your testimony and the role that they play in securing federal networks. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity to provide some public clarity on the implementation of CDM specifically. So can you give us some idea of um, how many departments and agencies have fully implemented uh, CDM phase one and how many agency dashboards are up and running? Is the DHS dashboard up and running? And, and uh, give us some perspective on that. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, CDM, we are um, in the process of deploying both phase one and phase two. Phase one being focused on hardware, software, asset management, sort of identifying what is on the networks internal to the agencies, and phase two looking at who's on the network. So uh, dealing with issues like um, access and identity management. Uh, we can get back to you with the specific numbers of agency deployment. They are all in various stages of of deployment, uh, we have uh, made it available to all agencies, but each individual agency is in a specific different stages of deploying. Um, we are nearing 20 agencies that have an agency dashboard up and running. And this month, the uh, department will, our Department of Homeland Security will be standing up the federal dashboard. So that will be receiving feeds from those agency dashboards. That will then allow us to have more near real time understanding of that, the, that sense and what those sensors are identifying on those agency networks and allow us to better prioritize vulnerability management for agencies. Terrific, thanks. Um, so one of the other points I wanted to uh, cover today was last week the GAO came out with a fairly critical report um, on the current state of federal cybersecurity. Uh, one of the most, what appeared to be at least troubling aspects of that was a statistic that said only 20. Uh, only seven of the 24 CFO Act um, agencies have programs with any functions um, uh, considered effective um, per the NIST standards for cybersecurity control. So um, that doesn't sound very good. I want to give uh, either you, Mr. Krebs, or you, Ms. Manfred, the opportunity to, um, you know, as we talk about the cybersecurity posture of the .gov, reconcile that with that GAO report. Sir, I think that we have we've learned a lot over the years about agency capacity to manage cybersecurity risks and the resources they have to to do so. I can say that agencies have prioritized the management of their cyber risk at the highest level across the government. What we have learned in the, both the deployment of CDM, our engagement and partnership with ONB in measuring agencies, is that there remain some significant gaps, and we have built over the last couple of years and, want, and are continuing to build uh, technical assistance capabilities, things like design and engineering, architecture reviews, helping agencies getting much more in-depth insight into their networks and providing them with a greater level of assistance, both engineering and on the governance side, to help them address the often very complicated networks with the limited resources we have. But we do see a lot of potential for CDM in the ability to deliver tools at a lower cost across agencies. And this is the first time that many agencies have had access to this level of automated uh, data to understand what is on their network. And so we see a lot of potential for this. But for, for many agencies, there is a lot of capability that has to be built. And we're continuing to take advantage of things like shared service, uh, more capability from DHS to deploy to agencies who, who need it most. So you just uh, you comment about uh, shared uh, services and uh, resources. I want to follow up on that a bit because I think it's important to look where we are, but also uh, look to where we're going. And so um, looking forward a bit, um, how do you see DHS's um, federal network protection tools evolving past, say, uh, signature-based threat detection tools and uh, particularly where my conversations with the administration and the cybersecurity advisors to the president really putting an emphasis on 
cloud computing and shared service, shared IT services and resources. So I guess in a sense, what does Einstein future generations, Einstein 10.0 look like? Well, sir, I'm not exactly sure what Einstein 10.0 will look like yet, but I can tell you where we're uh, looking to evolve. As agencies and the, the president's key initiative around modernizing our IT, and that's not just the technology. There are large challenges with legacy technology, but we also need to modernize uh, the way we govern and procure IT services within the government. As we do that, we're working very closely to modernize our security processes. So as we take advantage of things like cloud services, we ensure that we are modernizing our security approach, but also not losing the insight that we have into traffic, uh, either traversing internal to networks or in and out of um, agency networks. Importantly, we have um, learned on CDM uh, some key lessons from the first phases of deployment. We now have a new contract vehicle in place that will enable the deployment of cloud and mobile uh, security technologies in addition to the on-premise sensing capability that we have right now. So we are evolving and we are um, building on um, what industry is learning from uh, behavioral-based detection methods and we have had some successful pilots and we look forward to continuing to build that capability. Terrific, thanks very much. Um, my time's expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Richmond for his questions. And uh, Ms. Manfra or um, Mr. Krebs, either one, um, you all know that I authored legislation to call for a department-wide cybersecurity strategy within DHS. Uh, that strategy and report uh, was due in March. We still don't have it. So what's the status of it? Uh, and if you... Uh, if you're running into problems in getting it done, what are those problems? How can we help? Sir, thank you for the question. Um, the Office of Policy has the pin, so to speak, for drafting the Department's cybersecurity uh, strategy. It, it rolls in components across the department between the Secret Service, uh, ICE, uh, Homeland Security Investigations, the U.S. Coast Guard, Transporta Transportation Security Administration, as well as NPBD. So while we don't necessarily lead the development of that strategy, because it is a department-wide strategy, we are uh, a significant player. Now, to speak to the status of the, the strategy itself, my understanding of where it sits is uh, influenced by the President's Executive Order 13800 that was released back uh, earlier in the spring. Now, that report puts DHS at the front or in the lead for almost all of the reports, particularly in the, the first two and the fourth work stream, federal networks, critical infrastructure, and cyber workforce. So while those reports and assessments are underway, uh, they are anticipated to have significant impacts on some of the priorities, perhaps, of the department, including NPPD. So I believe the decision uh, on uh, finalizing the strategy has been to let's get through the cybersecurity uh, assessments related to the EO, as well as the administration's anticipated national security strategy and national cybersecurity strategy that are expected uh, in the next several months. And then when we have a broader, into, uh, broader understanding of where the department is going, uh, that will then uh, feed into the cybersecurity strategy. Uh, that said, rolling it all back to the requirement in the NDAA that you did that, that you offered, um, you know, it is still as a priority to finalize that report. Uh, that said, as a department, we are moving forward with a number of our uh, 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 priorities, and I, I do want to touch on a couple things you mentioned early. Um, as the senior official performing the duties of the undersecretary, while we do not have a permanent undersecretary for NPPD, I have been authorized and given the very clear direction uh, by Acting Secretary Duke to move out and execute every aspect of NPPD. So while we do not have a permanent undersecretary right now, I have all authority that I believe I need to execute the department's mission within NPPD. And <clears throat> with regards to a st strategy, and we talk about in terms of report, let me just Take that aside. Yes, sir. Do we have a department-wide strategy with how we're going to how we deal with <clears throat> um, cybersecurity and our needs and challenges that we're going to uh, continue to face in the near future? 
So there, my understanding is that there is a department-wide cybersecurity strategy in draft form. Yes, sir. So, <clears throat> and, and again, we, I, I don't want to get into the weeds. I'm just saying, are you all operating with some comprehensive I, strategy on a day-to-day -day basis to protect the cybersecurity? I, I understand. Yes, sir. So uh, going back to my opening remarks, I indicated that NPPD is in the lead for uh, ensuring the nation's critical infrastructure, both cybersecurity and physical threats. And under that are three goals. I mentioned the top goal, which is securing our federal networks and mm -hmm. facilities. For me, uh, and, and with Assist Assistant Secretary Manfra, that is at the very top of our minds every single day. The second piece is securing, uh, identify and mitigating systemic risk across the uh, infrastructure, the nation's infrastructure. When, you th when I think about that, I'm thinking about the Section 9 critical infrastructure at greatest risk, but I'm also putting election infrastructure in there. As I mentioned in my opening comments, that for me is the number one priority for NPPD from a critical infrastructure perspective. We cannot fail there. And third and finally is enabling and incentivizing better security practices across the broader uh, critical infrastructure community to include state, local, small, and medium-sized businesses. Ms. Hoffman, <clears throat> there's been a great deal of concern among national security experts that Russia's goal in disrupting the Ukraine's power supply in 2015 and 2016 was to test its capabilities in preparation for a large attack on the United States. Uh, last month, we learned that Russia may have been responsible for Dragonfly 2.0, uh, which exploited and targeted some of our energy sector. Uh, how is the energy sector responding, and what is their capabilities to prevent a widespread uh, attack? With that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. The Ukraine uh, attack was a very much an eye-opening event for the energy sector and the energy sector, specifically the electric sector, got very organized in recognizing that we had to continue to step up our continuous monitoring capabilities, our ability to detect behavior on the system, but also building inherent uh, protections as we develop new technologies. Recognize that the core of anything is protecting against spear phishing and passwords and credentials. And that's starting to really go after where do we need to be with respect to preventing an attack from occurring on the system. So we've been working very actively with the electric sector to build some tools and capabilities and for protections of their system. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from New York, Mr. Donovan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to ask one question of, of all of you. Um, in 2015, Congress passed the Cybersecurity Act. In 2017, we passed the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency Act, and the President also issued an executive order back in May to strengthen our abilities. What do you guys need? What can Congress do to help you protect our nation, our federal agencies, our private entities, as Mr. Richmond said, our energy industries, what do you guys need from us to help you protect our nation better than we're able to do now? Sir, thank you for the question. The, uh, the very first thing I would start with is, as you mentioned, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency Act of 2017. Passing out of the full committee was a significant step forward. What we need, as I mentioned in my opening comments, is quick action by the full House and the Senate. And let, me, let me give you a, re, a little anecdote about why that's important. That bill will give us three things. One, it'll allow us to introduce uh, some operational efficiencies, looking at common infrastructure across the organization, push them together uh, so that we are more streamlined in how we engage and deliver services from a customer service orientation. Uh, second, it'll It'll help with our branding and uh, clarify roles and responsibilities, not just within NPPD, but more importantly, with our federal partners, state and local partners, and the private sector. And I want to come back to that in just a second. And finally, what that's going to do is give us the ability to attract talent. Uh, we've talked a little bit about workforce, we've talked about hiring, and we've talked about partnership. But on that clarity of roles and responsibilities, let me talk about that for just a second. I've been down to Puerto Rico in the last, uh, twice in the last week. I was there last Monday with Administrator Long and Tom and uh, the President's Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert, and then I was here. I was there last Friday with Acting Secretary Duke. 
On Friday, meeting with Acting Secretary Duke, Governor Rosseo, and his key staff, uh, we were discussing a, discussing a number of the critical infrastructure challenges in Puerto Rico. Uh, when it came around to me, I talked about uh, the communications infrastructure. As, as you all know, the National Communications Center resides within uh, the Office of Cybersecurity and Communication, Assistant Secretary Manfred's, Manfred's uh, organization. Now, when we talked about the status of things, I, what I was talking about was how we are assisting the communications carriers, whether it's AT&T, Sprint, Claro, um, T-Mobile, Verizon, helping them get, get back in, prioritize deliveries of temporary uh, capabilities, this sell on wheels, sell on light trucks, things like that, to helping temporarily pop up the communications coverage, but at the same time helping them get resources in for cell towers. Now, as I briefed out where we were on helping those companies get resources back in, uh, I introduced myself as the senior pro official performing the duties of the undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate. Now, try repeating that back. It's not easy. So someone that has never heard that before immediately went on um, to a press interview and alongside the TSA administrator, Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the FEMA Regional Administrator, she said, we have FEMA, TSA, Coast Guard, and the comms guy. She doesn't know how to describe me. When I'm out engaging my stakeholders, they don't understand the mission I deliver. I need help in clarifying that and providing very front, up front, up front, clear what I do and what my team delivers. That is a significant advancement. So any help I can get there, please help me out. Uh, bro more broadly, though, in terms of additional uh, authorities and, and uh, clarification of authorities, we are in the process of running that kind of stock taking of where the department sits in cybersecurity. Uh, department of Energy and the FAST Act got significant authorities that uh, could come to bear in the, in the event of a grid incident. DHS has authorities in terms of incident response, information sharing. Thank you for those authorities. Going forward, we're not quite sure just yet what we need, but I'm going to tell you this. The cybersecurity threat is not going away. Our adversaries are getting better. They're getting faster. They're getting more agile. We need to be resourced. We need to be staffed. We need to be positioned to respond to that because I also know one more thing. We are not going to use less technology going forward. As you indicated earlier, we are going to the cloud. We are going to shared services. We are going to be relying upon these cross-cutting technology capabilities in the information technology sector. We need to be, ensure that from a digital defense perspective, we have what we need. So we, will, we welcome that conversation, and you can believe that you'll see me again, and we're going to be talking about that. Ms. Manfred, I have two seconds left in my, would you contribute, please? Uh, yes, sir. Very briefly, just to um, complement um, what Chris talked about, we're working with uh, within the federal government to understand what it, how, what is the full uh, breadth of our authorities. How can we lean into the existing authorities they have to de to deploy more capability? With the critical infrastructure sectors, we are working to understand now that we've identified these most critical assets at greatest risk. Are there legal and operational and policy hurdles that we need to address in order to ensure that we have appropriate prevention and response and recovery capabilities in place. So we look forward to working with you as we conclude this analysis. Please don't wait to another hearing. Let us know how we could help Absolutely, you. Absolutely, sir. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the time I don't have left. I thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the last two um, uh, speakers have talked about being resourced and staffed uh, from an agency standpoint. Uh, last March, uh, we held a hearing talking about staffing at the department. Uh, can you give us uh, the number of unfilled positions in the cyber uh, division right now? Sir, we are currently staffed at 76% of our uh, fully funded billets. So we are 24% under. Uh, can you tell us why uh, we are understaffed at this point? 
Yes, sir. There are a variety of reasons. The first, uh, largely thanks to the work in this committee and uh, our appropriations staff in, in Congress in uh, building the, the, the billets that are allocated to my organization. We have grown significantly. We've worked very hard to build according to those uh, to that growth in, in billets, but we have had some challenges. We've worked with our management colleagues and our human capital colleagues to identify areas where we can reduce the time to hire. I can say that looking at the statistics from fiscal year 16 hiring to fiscal year 17 hiring, we've been able to reduce the time to hire by 10 percent. We are uh, in many of these uh, requirements uh, have to do with security clearances. It does take a long time to uh, process people through that security clearance process, but we've made significant progress. We're continuing to work with our security office to identify ways that we can continue to shorten that. We're also uh, diversifying our recruitment paths, looking at the Scholarship for Service Cyber Corps program. It has been a great pipeline for us to bring to, after we the government has funded scholarships bringing these individuals in as interns and then hiring them full-time. They are already fully qualified for our direct hire authority and looking at other programs such as Pathways, uh, Presidential Management Fellows, and other recent graduate programs. We're also looking at um, partnerships with industry where yeah, they can... Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I don't mean to cut you off, but... Yes, sir. Uh, so is the problem we have too many programs to, to attach people to? Or, or I'm just trying to find out why... Uh, when we give you the authority to hire, why we've not mm -hmm. been able to to come closer to whatever that authority is, and is that see, something sir. we need to do uh, to get you to that point? Sir, I separate the uh, authority that we were given by Congress to build an accepted service program. What I was referring to was I did, not, I did not believe a couple of years ago we were fully leveraging the authorities we already had and the programs that we already had to bring people in and tightening the timeline that it takes to bring people on. The accepted service program is led by our chief human capital officer. This, I know this is a high priority for her. We uh, did not uh, probably appropriately expedite the development of that program four years ago. We have now done so. My understanding is that we will now be able to hire against that program uh, beginning in fiscal year 19, but there's a regulatory process that we do have to undergo as a part of that. Uh, just for the sake of uh, the committee, can you provide us with a timeline between when somebody who's considered for employment uh, and when that is completed? Is it uh, not just get back to us? Yes, sir. Uh, Whether it's three months, six months, a year, I think that would be instructive for us uh, so we can kind of see if there are some bottlenecks involved. Yes, sir. And the reason I say that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think all of us are constantly bombarded by people who are looking for employment opportunities. And if we have potential opportunities here, uh, is it something we are not doing? Are we not going out recruiting uh, in a broader view or just what? But we just need to yes, kind of figure something out. Right, and I do, if I could, sir, just clarify that the 76% is just indicating people that are on board right now. If you include the people that are in the full pipeline, that brings us about to 85%. And, and so for us, we're averaging about 224 days to hire. That sounds long, but that is to include a top secret SCI clearance process, which is actually a fairly for the benchmark of the rest, rest of the government. We're actually doing quite well. We want to continue uh, to work with you, sir, though. Uh, we will come uh, back with you. Just please get back yes, with sir. us. Uh, Mr. Krebs, uh, we have a uh, congressional task force on election security, and uh, we made a request of... Uh, the department to provide us uh, a classified briefing uh, around this issue. And uh, we've been told that it has to be bipartisan, that you can't just brief Democrats. Uh, are you aware of that? 
Sir, I'm, I'm not aware of any existing policy, but well, let me say this. I share your concern on election infrastructure. I think I've made that clear today, and I want to say it directly to you as well, that it is my top priority at the department. Again, if we can't do this right, if we can't dedicate every single asset we have to assisting our state and local partners, then, frankly, you know, I'm not sure what we're doing day to day. So in terms of what we've done in terms of engagements, uh, we are prioritizing delivery of those uh, of, uh, briefings, information sharing to our state and local partners. We are doing it in a bipartisan manner because my opinion is that this does transcend party lines and we should be doing this all pulling the same direction. Uh, so going forward, uh, I, I would encourage any um, additional briefings. And we have provided a series of bipartisan briefings to the House Homeland Security Committee, uh, both classified and unclassified. Uh, the real crux of this issue the underpinning issue here is a trusted relationship. Now, did we have some? No, yes, no, sir. No, I, I, I appreciate it, but uh, we have established a, uh, a working group within uh, the Democrats on the committee, and we're just trying to get a briefing. So I think uh, it's nice to say, I don't want to brief you because there are no Republicans, but we're members of Congress. And all we're trying to do is get access to the information. And uh, if your interest is there, I'm convinced that you'll provide it. And that, that's the spirit uh, in which uh, the request was made. So uh, we'll make it again. Yes, sir. And uh, look forward to you coming back. Just bring us what information you have uh, as members of, of uh, 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 Congress. And that's, that's all we, we're asking. Thank you. Yes, sir. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank the ranking member. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Garrett. Hit my talk button. My voice sounds better with the microphone on. Um, but I want to piggyback on what my friend and colleague, ranking member Thompson, said and suggest that I would agree with you that uh, election infrastructure, cybersecurity as it relates to partnering with states whose responsibility it is to oversee and conduct elections is, is a priority that crosses and transcends the aisle. And I would ask that any briefing that you give to Democrat members, you also perhaps invite me to, or give the exact same briefing to Republican members, which I think is inconsiderate of your time, given that that would be a great redundancy. But I can't fathom why one party should be briefed on cybersecurity as it relates to our elections in the absence of another in the United States of America. So if you do, in fact, and I hope you will, uh, respond to the ranking member's request to brief on elect election, uh, electoral security as it relates to cyber issues, uh, please invite me. Uh, because I can't fathom that, that one party has a monopoly on hoping that we can have free and fair and trustworthy elections. And I'm sure that my colleague didn't mean it that way, but I, I just want to be very clear in suggesting that that should not be a partisan issue and that perhaps maybe people from both parties should be invited or we could just make you give the same briefing twice, which again I think is inconsiderate and short-sighted. Having said that, uh, transitioning to what we know as it relates to malicious Russian cyber activity, um, specifically re with relation to uh, Estonia and the Ukraine, based on my understanding, the bulk of the platforms used to infiltrate uh, infrastructure uh, I say platforms, um, malware, uh, it would appear, based on my ability to speak in this forum, were off the shelf, if, if you will. Kill disk, for example, Black Energy were um, known uh, entities that were discovered as it, as it relates to these attacks as part of a coordinated attack. It, 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 how do we, how well do we stay ahead or, or try to stay online with, and I understand that it, it's a moving target, uh, the malware that might be implemented, because it, to the extent that there's any hope, and again, I understand the format that we're in might limit the conversation that we have, um, a lot of the um, malicious activity to this point conducted, we presume, and, and, and data would indicate by the Russians, has used off-the-shelf technology. So I guess the, the question there is, how quickly can we pick up on advancements in malware and then sort of inculcate them into our uh, into our preventative measures? And that's wide open to whichever one of you wonderful folks would like to address it. 
Thank you, sir. So if I may, I'll, I'll start and provide a bit of a broader approach and then defer to my uh, expert colleague from the Department of Energy on anything specific to the, the grid and electricity. And I'm, su I'm subject to a time limit, Got it. so I apologize. But So I'll do this quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, generally speaking, when we talk, we've already talked about advanced persistent threat here. Uh, when, when we think about uh, threats, it's not necessarily, generally speaking, advanced. It's just persistent. Folks are still, companies or organizations are still not doing the basic blocking and tackling. When you think about WannaCry, when you think about NotPetya, some of those exploitations were based on open, known vulnerabilities. They just weren't patched. So z the concept of a zero-day exploit, while it's out there, it's not actually the primary exploit uh, that we tend to see in the wild. So uh, let me interrupt you. Um, and I am a big fan of limited government, but in this arena, because the entire nation hangs in the balance, not just our elections, but everything as it relates to our grid, um, might it not be uh, uh, effective to hit the particular power providers where it counts, and that is essentially make it cost something, perhaps metaphorically and literally, for entities that don't patch those open known threats? And that's something that would be within the purview of the government, right? You will be up to date on X, Y, and Z, or it'll cost you. Would that be something that, that's been explored? So my colleague, Jeanette Manfro, uh, can speak to the government piece, and then we'll talk. OK, just uh, Again, very, I'm not, very I'm not briefly. To, you guys are great. I just, five minutes. No problem. Um, so very, very briefly, the first binding operational directive we issued for federal agencies was um, reducing the time to patch critical vulnerabilities to 30 days. We have actually seen a complete cultural change as a result of that, and we are now seeing the government highly prioritizing p patching those critical vulnerabilities. So I just wanted to uh, throw that out there. So there's a carrot and a stick, right? And I'm Correct, suggesting sir. the stick, but the carrots, I'd rather the carrot. But but I'm glad to hear you say you're addressing that. And, I, and, and again, Ms. Hoffman, I don't mean to cut short. I got 15 seconds. I want to speak to the nature of NERC and, and, and whether or not the fact that it's a semi-private autonomous pseudo entity compromises uh, intelligence, tactics, tactics, procedures, et cetera. So I don't think NERC as an organization compromises any sort of intelligence. It does have the Information Sharing Analysis Center, which is our mechanism for sharing information to the sector writ large. It also has capabilities to compel and look at uh, the industry to respond so we can get the information we need. Thank you all, and I apologize uh, for going briefly over. Uh, thank the gentleman, and the chair uh, recognizes my friend from uh, Rhode Island, uh, Congressman Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses uh, for your testimony here. Bef uh, before I go into my uh, questions, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, for uh, just publicly, and in particular to Mr. Garrett, that so I'm a member of uh, the Elections Task Force uh, that uh, the, the, certainly the Democrats have put together on uh, how to go forward in improving election security. And I would say to my colleague that there was an initial effort in outreach to Republicans uh, to make this a bipartisan effort, uh, which was not accepted. It was, uh, there was no, we didn't, uh, there was not, uh, we didn't find anyone that was receptive. Um, but I would say this, uh, the task force meetings are open to the public. My colleague, Mr. Uh, Garrett, is welcome to participate uh, fully with that. And with respect to the ranking members, uh, question on the uh, the classified briefing, both on Russian interference in our elections and um, and how we're better securing our election systems. Uh, that is a uh, whether it's uh, Democrats only or Democrats and Republicans. I would prefer it as a Democrat and Republican briefing. But however we get the briefing, I, I want I unless I'm misunderstanding what the ranking member was asking. Uh, we just want the briefing, so uh, we'd ask that uh, you'd provide that to us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I do believe we have provided a classified briefing in the past and welcome uh, the full committee briefing or the subcommittee briefing on that as well. Yes, sir. So uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that, uh, Mr. Krebs, I appreciate your comments that you have all the authorities in your acting role uh, to do the job necessary in cyber. Uh, but I would reiterate that it's, uh, it is vitally important that we get key people uh, appointed and, and in place uh, permanently. I, I respect the work that you're doing and your team. And, and um, and uh, uh, but it, we we need uh, we need permanent people in, in place to both inspire confidence and clarity to what uh, what the mission is. Um, so let me get into my questions very quickly. Um, I'm going to try to go through them uh, for the ones you can't answer fully uh, because of time constraints. I'd request a uh, a follow up in in, in writing. Um, and uh, so on September 13th, 
uh, DH issued a, bre a, um, a binding operational directive, 1701, which directed Federal executive branch departments and agencies to remove Kaspersky products from the systems within the next 90 days. Um, in, in doing so, DHS for the first time issued a public statement uh, to coincide with the establishment of the directive, and, and uh, which I would like to commend the Department uh, for this, this added transparency. I thought that was, uh, that was important. My question is, uh, what analysis led to the removal of Kaspersky from Federal networks? And uh, this is a case I understand that this answer uh, may be classified, uh, in which case I, I uh, uh, would request that, uh, that you and your team provide a briefing to members uh, on uh, the deliberations behind it. I think that is something that is vitally important that this committee uh, on both sides of the aisle under, understand uh, what went into that. Next, uh, Mr. Krebs, uh, the SEC was breached uh, in late 2016, uh, and we now know that the attackers had access to uh, corporate filings prior to their public release. Uh, the announcement of this breach was made nearly a, uh, a year after it was first discovered. Uh, my question was, when was DHS informed uh, of the, uh, the breach? And what was DHS's involvement in detecting, responding and recovering uh, from, these, uh, from, uh, from this attack? And uh, finally, uh, how can DHS improve its integration uh, with uh, Federal agencies to ensure that these types of attacks are detected and notified quicker in the future. Thank you, Congressman Langevin. Let me briefly touch on the Kaspersky piece, and then I'll kick it over to Assistant Secretary Manfred. So in Kaspersky, that determination was based on the totality of evidence, including by, on the most part, uh, open source information. And in terms of a classified briefing, I believe we are on the schedule for some point in the next month or so with the full committee, uh, the monthly intel briefing. So with that, if I may, I'd like to turn it over to Thank you. Assistant I'd Secretary welcome the briefing. Thank you. Sir, yes. Uh, Welcome to support a, uh, a briefing on uh, Kaspersky. As far as the SEC, we are also happy to come in and have a more fulsome conversation with you about that. They did notify us uh, last year on November 4th of an issue. It was at the time, the extent of the issue was not well understood. And given the, the time limits here, I think it might be more useful if we sat down with you and, if, uh, and other staff members as appropriate to um, walk through specific details. Okay. And, and what do you think that, um, uh, what, what was the, the, the uh, DHS involvement in, though, in, in detecting and responding to the recovery, though? Uh, sir, we have very limited involvement with the SEC. They did not request our follow-on assistance for a response. Okay. Um, and on the, uh, uh, the issue of how they can work better uh, in the future. So one of the, in addition to this incident, as well as several others, we are reviewing our uh, procedures to ensure that it's clear that when, a, when an incident happens, what role the department needs to play in a response, not just at the request of an agency, and that if we're looking at specific critical services and functions, then the department needs to have a more active role in that response, regardless of whether the agency um, requests it. Thank you. In August, uh, Congressman Will Hurd and I uh, uh, traveled to uh, DEF CON as a bipartisan trip to that, con that security conference, and I think we both were impressed by the willingness of security researchers to report vulnerabilities in order to improve overall Internet security. Uh, what efforts has the Department made to establish a vulnerability reporting process for uh, DHS sites and, and software? Again, one of the things that I found uh, with um, so the, the Pentagon's bug bounty program was very helpful in identifying security vulnerabilities and getting them to the attention of the right individuals to close those vulnerabilities. And talking to security researchers, one of the things that impressed me the most is that they just want to make the Internet work better. And, and, but they want to know that when they find a vulnerability, there's a path forward that they can report it and that someone's actually going to do something about it, that they're actually going to be heard. So what progress has DHS made in this respect? 
So we actually have a very long-standing program on both operational technology vulnerabilities, so industrial control systems, as well as uh, enterprise technologies. And we've been working with security researchers in both communities for years to um, provide them a space for them to identify that vulnerability and also to advocate with the owner of that software for a, a patch. And much of the alerts that we issue are the result of collaboration with security researchers. Uh, we also have our own organization within my group that conducts penetration testing and risk and vulnerabilities assessments across the government to include uh, DHS networks. So while uh, bug bounty programs can be useful, we need to ensure that they're supplemented with the broader uh, risk and vulnerability analysis and testing that my organization does to ensure organizations are appropriately prioritizing what they're addressing. Okay, what about DH, DHS's uh, specifically owned uh, systems? My organization also supports uh, penetration testing and vulnerability assessments within the DHS, particularly the high value assets that DHS owns. But I do uh, know that our leadership and the uh, management is interested in learning from what the Department of Defense has done in their bug bounty program and how that might apply uh, to DHS. And so we're continuing to work through how that might be applied for, for our organization. Ms. Chen, I had, I had uh, one more on. Um uh, on election security, can I ask that? Uh, so uh, I know we've touched on this a bit, but I, for the record, I really wanted to dive a little deeper into this. So I'm very interested, obviously, ensuring that, that state and local elected officials have access to resources from DHS to protect uh, the vital systems that, uh, that represent the cornerstone of our, of our democracy. So can you further describe how DHS is working with election officials to report, uh, to, uh, to protect networks uh, do you believe that DHS's response to the unprecedented interference in our elections last year really has been sufficient? And, and finally, how can we improve the relationship and access to resources? Are there additional funds or resources that the department needs in this respect? So thank you for uh, those questions. Uh, in turn, let me start at the, at the end with your improving relationships. Uh, while I was not at the department last summer, uh, as this all manifested, I can speak to generally the relationships with uh, state election officials. Uh, that was not an existing relationship between the Department of Homeland Security uh, in the state and locals. Uh, however, we do have strong relationships, of course, with the Homeland Security Advisors and the Chief Information Officers and Chief Information Security Officers. Uh, but to square the circle on this specific threat, we need to develop partnerships that are you know, three or four legs on the stool within each specific state. And each state is going to uh, be a little bit different uh, in terms of how, you know, who they designated as the chief election official, as well as you roll in the vendors of the technology. So in terms of how to improve relationships, it's gonna take a lot of effort and a little bit of time. And those are things that we are working on right now. Uh, we don't have much time, but we are dedicating resources. In fact, just this morning, I sent out a notice across my organization, NPPD, uh, uh, reflecting some changes we made organizationally last week by establishing an election task force. Uh, previously, uh, the election infrastructure piece had been held within the Office of Infrastructure Protection as a program. Again, matching my words with our execution, we're elevating it as a task force, bringing components from our pieces from across the DHS components, including the Office of Intelligence Analysis, and resourcing it appropriately. And this is speaking to the a lot of ref, uh, resources. We're pulling the resources together in recognition that we don't have a lot of time, given there are three elections this year. And the number of FTEs and money that actually is actually committed to this? Uh, I don't have the FTEs on hand right now, but I, I can get back to you on that one. I believe Ms. Manfred has And the, and the funds as well, specifically. Yes. And um, if I could just make one additional point on the resources. Ranking Member Richmond noted that his understanding was that there was a nine-month wait for risk and vulnerability assessments. Um, I don't know whether that's the exact current number, but that, that um, speaks to the high demand that we're experiencing for our assessment services, and that is everything from um, penetration testing 
to the cyber hygiene scans that multiple states and localities have uh, uh, participated in and continue to participate in, as well as these more in-depth risk and vulnerability assessments. We are growing that program. Uh, we are diverting resources. Uh, we're building the infrastructure so that, or, so that we can uh, more scale that. But these are services that we are providing, not just to federal agencies, but also to state and local governments, as well as critical infrastructure. And we're experiencing uh, much more demand for those services, and we're continuing to look for ways to um, scale that capability. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Again, if there are follow-up that you can provide to, uh, to us in writing or in briefings, I, I, I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. You're welcome. Gentlemen, um, yields back, and uh, I want to thank all three of our witnesses today for your uh, valuable and insightful testimony. Uh, thank all the members for their questions today. The members of the committee do have some uh, additional questions for witnesses, and um, we'll ask you to respond to those in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, uh, the hearing record will be held open for a period of 10 days, and without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>